Hi everyone. In this video, I am going to walk you through accounting for depreciation using the straight line method of depreciation. So the straight line method is actually one of the most common methods of depreciation. Um, and one of the reasons it's, it's the most common is because it, it's really easy to do, actually. Um, if you think about the idea of depreciation, you have fixed assets that have a capitalized cost to them based on the initial um, uh, value that you paid to acquire them or put them into use. A portion of that capitalized cost is the portion that you as a company feel you will actually use up before you ultimately dispose of the asset. And we refer to that portion as the depreciable cost. As part of depreciation, we need to take that depreciation, uh, that depreciable cost, and, and we need to have some sort of unit over which to spread that cost. What makes straight line um, so easy to adopt is that it uses time as that spreadable unit. So basically, it's not a matter of, oh, we think this machine will produce 300 um, units of product, or we think this building will serve you know, um, 10,000 customers worth of foot traffic or something like that. It's just, hey, we think this machine will last five years. We think this building will last 30 years, right? So you're using time as the measure of asset usefulness, and that time is what you will then um, allocate your depreciable capitalized costs over, and you'll do so equally. That's where the word straight line comes from. It's not a matter of, oh, you expense more in one year than another year and all that. It's just over whatever time period you have, you equally, over a straight line, depreciate um, uh, the value of your asset. So here I have an excerpt from Starbucks 2019 10K. And this is just kind of show you um, how companies disclose this to investors. Notice here, um, this is their footnote for property, plant, and equipment. It says, property, plant, and equipment, which includes assets under capital leases, are carried at cost less accumulated depreciation. So historical cost minus accumulated depreciation. Costs include all direct costs necessary to acquire and prepare the assets for use. So that's describing the idea of capitalization. Um, and then it says, depreciation is computed using the straight line method over estimated useful lives, which generate range, and they give you a, a range um, different for equipment and, and buildings. And even within equipment and buildings, they have different policies that apply depending on the type of equipment, type of building. And I won't go on to read the rest because the rest um, talks about leasehold improvements, things of that nature. But basically, every company has to um, come up with uh, not only the capitalized cost of their assets, but a method to depreciate them. And they have to disclose all that to investors. As you see here with straight line, um, this is an example of Starbucks describing its way of allocating straight line depreciation to its fixed assets. Now, nothing helps students understand depreciation more than literally just walking through the math, like showing an example and seeing how it goes. So here you have it. Flyer Corps put a building into service on January 1st. The capitalized cost of the building was $559,000. Flyer Corps' depreciation policy states that buildings should be depreciated using the straight line method, assuming a useful life of 30 years. And for this particular building, Flyer Corps expects to recover $334,000 of the original cost upon resale. So let's go ahead and identify the various components here. It says the capitalized cost of the building was $559,000. So that's given to us straight up. That is the capitalized cost. But it also said at the end that Flyer Corps expects to recover $335,000 of that cost upon resale. Whenever you expect to recover part of your original cost, that is what is known as the salvage value of the asset. And it's the difference between the capitalized cost and the salvage value that ends up telling you your depreciable cost or the amount of the asset you think you'll actually use up. So 559 cap cost minus the 334 salvage value equals, if we do the math on this, so that's 522, looks like 225,000 depreciable cost. So notice we have here total original cost, portion we don't expect to use. So we expect somebody to actually pay us that when we get rid of the asset, portion we do expect to use. It's the portion we do expect to use that we then have to depreciate over whatever measure of life we have for this asset. In the case of straight line, 
time is that life? And we've established in this policy that that time is going to be 30 years. So divide it by 30 years useful life. Pull up my calculator for this one. We've got 225,000 divided by 30 years. Works out to 7,500 per year. And that is going to be our depreciation each year. Okay. The problem here asks us to compute the annual depreciation expense. There we have it. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, that's the math, and it's the same math for every straight line calculation, right? It's just you, you subtract your salvage value from your capitalized cost, get the depreciable cost, divide by the years, you've got your depreciation per year. But I do want to talk about the financial statement impact of, of doing this. Um, notice here that I have set up what's called a depreciation schedule, and this is where you essentially list every year of life for the asset, and then you show the effects of depreciation on that asset. Now this first column here, the depreciation expense, that's what's gonna hit our income statement. Notice we just calculated the depreciation expense was 7,500 per year. So every single year, year one, year two, year three, all the way to year 30, we are going to hit every single year our income statement, depreciation expense, $7,500, and that's gonna eat into our net income. On our balance sheet, however, there's going to be a little bit different situation going on. On our balance sheet, start with this middle column here. Um, we've got the gross PP&E, which represents the historical cost of the asset. So when you see building on the balance sheet, that's what we're talking about here. And notice it starts off in year one at 559, and year two it's 559, and year three it's 559, and all the way to year 30 it stays at 559. The asset itself does not change value on the balance sheet. It is recorded at historical cost. It stays at historical cost. But we are going to pair that asset up with what's known as the accumulated depreciation for that asset. And the difference between the accumulated depreciation and the depreciation expense is that accumulated depreciation is a running total. So notice in year one, the two are identical. Depreciation expense 7,500, accumulated depreciation 7,500. But in year two, depreciation expense is still 7,500 because that's for that year, but now the accumulated depreciation is doubled. It's up to 15,000. Year three, 7,500, 22,500. Year four, 7,500, 30,000. And the process continues all the way to year 30. So the depreciation expense is the same amount every year, but the accumulated depreciation is going up by that expense every year. That comes from the depreciation journal entry. If you're familiar with that, it's debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. So notice that expense gets recorded every year. That expense shows up on the income statement, but the income statement is only for that period of time. But every time you record that expense, you increase this accumulated depreciation on the balance sheet, which is why it constantly increases. Now, going back to year one, on our balance sheet, we're gonna show the historical cost of the asset. We're gonna have below it less accumulated depreciation, and when you net those two together, we get what's known as the book value of the asset, in this case, 551,500. That is what the asset still has in terms of value, the value we haven't used up yet. And of course, that net book value, because gross PP&E stays the same, but accumulated depreciation keeps increasing, that net value is gonna keep decreasing because accumulated depreciation, the number that's increasing is a subtraction from the gross value. The ultimate result of all this, and, and here's the point that I really wanna hammer home, is by the time you get to end of life, year 30, you have fully depreciated the depreciable cost of the asset. And so your accumulated depreciation is up to, in this example, $225,000. Because $7,500 year after year for 30 years finally did add up to a loss of value of two twenty-five dollars over that 30-year life. Your historic cost still is unchanged, but that means your now net or book value of the PP&E is down to three thirty-four, dollars And that's not coincidence that that equals the salvage value that we originally established for this item. That's the whole goal. When you get to end of life, 
you should have an asset on the books equivalent to what you think you're going to get paid when you dispose of it. Now, does that mean it's actually going to come true? Absolutely not. Disposals is a whole nother ball of wax that could result in gains or losses when the disposal price actually differs from the expected price. I'll deal with that in other videos. For now, just know that this is the way depreciation is designed to work. Now, one last thing I do have to point out before we um, bring this video to a close is um, you do sometimes have to deal with partial years of depreciation. So in this, I, I switch the example just a little bit. If you remember in our example, we said um, that they put a building into service on January 1. And so this one switches it and just says, well, what if it wasn't January 1? What if it was April 1st? But you're still dealing with like a December year end client. Well, in that case, that year one is actually a partial year because you didn't start at the beginning of the year. You started part way in. And so your depreciation expense for year one is going to be a little low. The reason for that is because only nine months went by, April through December. And so whereas normally you would have recorded 7,500 in depreciation in year one, you have to multiply that by nine out of 12 months, the portion of the year that went by, and that gives you the partial depreciation for year one. From years two all the way to year 30, you will then continue to have the standard full year of depreciation because you do have the building in service for the entirety of the years for those other years. It's only that first year where it ends up being a, a partial. But if you're wondering, well, wait, but, but then you're never going to hit your salvage value if, 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 if you just leave this at a partial year and then do 7,500 every other year. Well, that's because when you start midway through a year, you're actually going to spill over into an extra year, a, a partial extra year. Because you're not actually going to hit your 30 years of life until you get to the end of March, right, before you hit April 1st, till you get to the end of March of the 31st year in this situation. And so what's going to happen is in year 31, you're going to have that 7,500 annual depreciation times three out of 12 months, only January, February, March, for 1875 partial depreciation, if you look at the combination of that partial year one and that partial year 31, those actually add up to a grand total of $7,500. Those two partial years actually represent one full year of depreciation, and you still wind up with your accumulated depreciation equaling your full depreciable cost and your net book value equaling the expected salvage value once you hit that end. It's just it won't align cleanly with your company's year end. It'll spill over a few months into the following year to fulfill the full life um, of the asset. So that's how you deal with partial year depreciation. That's how it kind of differs from a financial statement perspective. Um, journal entries are still all the same. Debit depreciation, expense credit, accumulated depreciation. Just your first and last year might have a little bit different calculation because they're only partial years. All right, so that is it for straight line depreciation. Again, it's, it's the easiest and most common method of depreciation. Once you've got the formula down, it's just a rinse and repeat every time you see it. Um, I hope you found this helpful, and I hope you join me for another video.